Well, good morning and welcome to the Oaks Church. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Terry Lee and I'm one of the pastors here at the Oaks. Uh, Whether you are a first time guest or you call the Oaks home, I'm extremely glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Uh, We know that there are a lot of places that you could be this morning, but we're glad that you're here. Uh, We are about to jump into the Word of God together. Uh, If you have a Bible, go ahead and find 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That's where we're going to be this morning. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. The words will be on the screen behind me. And we also have several on our Connect table in the back that we would love for you to grab uh, as you're out the door this morning or even now. That's our gift to you because we want you to be in the Word, not only on Sunday mornings, but also throughout the week. Um, As we dive into 1 Corinthians, I'll go ahead and tell you this is a letter that we've been looking at from Paul since September of last year. So uh, the Lord has a lot to say to this young church about what he's doing in the church, and we are learning that through the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, So as we look at this, we're really going to get to one of the big existential questions of life this morning right here in the middle of 1 Corinthians 10. What is it all for, right? As, as you look each week and, and you see that student loan debt accruing, maybe you're wondering, what is it all for? And maybe whenever you drive out of uh, work on a Friday afternoon and, and realize that you've already put 60 hours in and you're gonna have to come back the next day, you're wondering, what is it all for, right? Uh, maybe, maybe there are uh, another, there are other aspects of your life. Maybe you're thinking about relationships. You're thinking about getting a second degree. You're, you're thinking about all of these different things. And perhaps you, you've almost numbed yourself to that question because really thinking about the long term, the 30,000 foot view of what is my life actually for scares you, right? And you're kind of like, well, if I can just get through the week, I can handle this, right? I don't have to think about long-term. I don't have to think about big picture. I just want to think about now. I don't want to have to think about, and what is this all really about? Why are you here this morning? Well, I mean, what, what are we truly living for? And I think that's a question that perhaps we just need to pause and think about. In the 1600s, uh, there was a group of pastors that came together, uh, both lay and, and those who were pastors as a career, and they began thinking, you know, what, what should we do? What would be helpful if we were to come up with perhaps a list of questions that would help young Christians, both in maturity and actually young children, to grow up into the faith? What is the first question that we would want to be on their mind? And the very first question they presented is, what is the chief end of man? What is the purpose of man? Why do we have breath in our lungs? Why do we exist? What are we here for? Now we see that question hasn't changed for each one of us. And their answer to that question was the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You were created. You have air in your lungs. You exist for the glory of God like, let's just pause there. Let's try to wrap our minds around the fact that the God of all creation, who hung the stars and moon, who who lets volcanoes erupt for the sake of his glory, and shooting stars streak across the sky for the sake of his glory, the one who paints unique sunsets every single day for the sake of his glory, wants to use your life for the sake of his glory wants to use something so mundane as you checking the mail and washing the dishes for his glory, wants to use what you will do with the next remaining hours of this day for his glory. What a mind-expanding view of every second of your life, that there is no tick on the clock that can be wasted or is ordinary because you exist for the glory of God. Now, here's the reason that that is good news, because you exist to glorify God, and also to enjoy him forever. There's this correlation here between you living for the glory of God and your personal joy. There is nothing that will bring more joy to your life, more satisfaction to your life, more fulfillment in your life than living your life as God designed for his glory. 
What an amazing truth. How would your life change if you took this one thing, forgot everything else that I said for the rest of the morning, and said, my life is designed to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that that is the exact intent that God created Adam and Eve with. Perhaps we would say our first parents, right, were created in the garden to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Adam was created to work and keep the garden. His helper, Eve, there, they're working alongside one another. Everything is perfect, right? And then they believe the lie of the serpent. They believe God is holding something away from them, that their life would actually be more joyful if they took something that God said would be harmful for them. So they take, they eat, they make a God out of this fruit, like we often do with our idols. We say, no, I actually think this will satisfy. And what happens? Everything breaks. We are no longer glorifying God as we should, but we become, we become glorifiers of self. We seek glory in our work. We seek glory in the title we have. We seek glory in our relationships. We seek glory in the approval of others. We, we ask other things to glorify us and the glory that we were designed to give God, we thieve for ourselves. Oh, no longer glorifying God, but instead sinning against him. And we know that Paul would say the wages of this sin is death, not just a physical death, but a spiritual death and separation from God. We would see this echo throughout the pages of scripture as people saw the commands of God and unable to keep them. And we could look at our own lives this week and see the various commands of God that we have broken, either accidentally or with bold purpose and intentionality. And we look at the church in Corinth, people that had been redeemed by God. I don't know if you had time to read the, the verses that came up on the screen as the video was playing, but it just goes through this list of different ways that they have transgressed God. It ways that they have rebelled his good and gracious command. And then Paul tells them with this list of sins in the backdrop that such were some of you. At some point, each of these sins personally characterized your life, but in Christ, you've been washed. In Christ, you've been made holy. You've been justified. You have been sanctified. And with that banner over their life, with that truth of God's grace, they still sought after other things. When we get into 1 Corinthians 10, I want to give you a little bit of context as to what's going on here. The, the church in Corinth had written a, a letter to Paul asking him several questions. And one of the questions that they asked him that we'll finish up today is what should we do with food that has been offered to idols? Um, food that had been sacrificed to an idol was often sold for a discount price in the market. And so they would just say, hey, is it okay for us, even though this was once sacrificed to a pagan idol, for us to be able to eat this and buy this at a discounted price? And so with, with that being the case, Paul addressed them and said, you know what, if it doesn't bother your conscience, that's okay, um, you can eat it. But don't eat it in a pagan temple because that would be the same as idolatry. That would be uniting yourself to that pagan God. And also don't eat it if it's gonna hurt someone else's conscience. And so that's what we're gonna dive into today. And we're gonna see the transcendent principle that he kind of puts behind every action of life. So if you have your Bible, jump into verse 23 with me in chapter 10. The word of God says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of what for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, 
not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. The main thing that I want you to see from this passage this morning is that we should live to glorify God and for the good of others. That we should live for the glory of God and the good of others. This is what Paul is talking about in this passage. Uh, Let's just kind of roll through the scriptures that I just read. He says in verse 23, all things are lawful. And as you look at your scripture there, you see that that's in quotation marks, right? All things are lawful. He's actually quoting the church in Corinth uh, because something that they would say fairly often is, hey, all things are lawful for me. So if I wanna do that, no big deal, right? Um, As you could probably imagine, they're in ancient Corinth, uh, very, very influenced by uh, the ideas of Platonism where your spiritual body and your physical body are kind of two separate things. So they would think something very much like, well, as long as I'm spiritually honoring God, then why does it really matter if I'm doing something else with my body? Uh, This is why the church had, uh, in, in many ways, a lot of issues with people getting drunk, a lot of issues with people in the church committing prostitution, a lot of just really things that we would look at, like why did they think that was okay? But they were so influenced by their culture and this idea that, hey, as long as I'm doing the right thing, kind of like between me and God, then, then my hands and just what I do with my actual physical body doesn't really matter. And so they would say something like, all things are lawful for me. If Christ has freed me from the Mosaic law, then I can just live free, right? God's grace will be there again to meet me in the morning, no matter how I feel when I wake up. And so what Paul is saying is, hey, look, even if something is lawful for you, even if you're able to eat something that was sacrificed to an idol, that doesn't mean that it's helpful for your soul. And you are an embodied soul. There's, there's not this difference, right, between just the physical and the spiritual, but that you are an embodied soul and God has purchased all of it. So, so even if you believe that all things are lawful, It doesn't mean that all things are helpful for you and you should just allow yourself to do whatever you want. The second thing he says when he quotes them again is all things are lawful, but not all things build up. So not all things are going to not only build up your faith, but build up the faith of others. Uh, There are things that are actually extremely harmful here to you. Verse 24, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Uh, There is a prompt here to live your life in a way to where you're not only considering how something affects you, but how it affects other people. Verse 25, he kind of gets into this scenario here where he says, eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Um, So if, if you are over at a friend's house is kind of the next scenario that he's going to bring up here. He says, if you are invited into an unbeliever's house, all right, let's, let's stop right there. The church in Corinth was, they were good enough friends with unbelievers that Paul is making the assumption that they're consistently going to be invited into the houses of unbelievers, does that not sound like Jesus, right? We look at, through the gospels and we see Jesus is consistently in the house of people who don't follow him yet, uh, who, of people who have very different views, right? This should be a mark of the life of a Christian that you are, you are consistently living life among people who don't know him yet so that they can display the love of Christ in you. So Paul says, hey, whenever you're over at an unbeliever's house and they, they set, you know, a pot roast in front of you or, you know, they've got something where they put it on the table, don't say, um, has this been offered to an idol? He's just like, no, just don't, don't worry about it. That could, that could be offensive to them. But if, verse 28, someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of the conscience. So if someone comes up to you, the the person that presented it, maybe they're a non-believer and they say, hey, just so you know, this was given as a sacrifice at the temple of Apollos. Well, then obviously their conscience is going to think that you're associating with an idol if you eat that. So just don't do it, right? Because it could make your faith look inconsistent. Or there's another brother or sister in the room that that sees that thing taking place and they say, hey, just so you know, that was sacrificed to an idol. And if they do that, then Paul says there's a good chance 
that their conscience is pricked by that. And, and because of that, you don't want to harm them by eating of it. So he's basically just saying, be smart, okay? And he gets into all this and then gives a transcendent principle because honestly, we can read this and think like, okay, Paul, like probably not gonna be in this scenario this week. Like nobody's gonna say like, I picked this up from Kroger, not sure what happened to it before it got on our plate, you know? Like no, nobody's gonna say that. So, so what do we actually need to know? Well, Paul gives a transcendent principle here for all of life. He says in verse 31, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Why does this passage matter for you? Because you were designed to do all for the glory of God. This passage is not just about you eating food offered to idols or not. This is about you giving glory to God in every aspect of your life. Now you could hear that and think, that's a lot of weight, right? I'm supposed to give glory to God in everything. Like I used to just be stressed out about making sure that I was at church on Sunday and reading my Bible regularly and like trying to listen to Christian radio. And now you're telling me that the way that that I drive, like God cares about that. Like how am I supposed to live like this? That could be extremely stressful. But how comforting is it to know that God, God cares about every aspect of our life. That, that Jesus didn't just redeem you for the spiritual parts of your life, but that Jesus has redeemed you in such a way that, that he bought every part of your life and cares about the intricate details of your life. So how do we live for God's glory in such a way? The first thing I want you to see this morning is that God is glorified by our dependence and our gratitude. We look at this and... And we think, right, how, how can we actually live for the glory of God? And the thing that I want you to see here is that the heart behind the actions matter so much than the actions in themselves, right? How do we glorify God in everything we do? We glorify God by our, by our dependence upon him and our gratitude toward him. It's not just about the actions that we do, this list of things that we're accomplishing, but the actual heart in which we act. Now, I want you to imagine this perhaps um, will be helpful for you. Imagine someone who decides to become a monk, right? Because, you know, why not? Surely that would please God, but they become a monk, and what actually happens is they realize, man, that really impresses people. Like whenever I spend hours in solitude, the thing that people say is, he is so self-disciplined. Well, whenever I begin quoting scripture, people admire how well uh, I, I've, I've begun to memorize scripture and it really gives me a lot of, of sense of approval. Th- something that would, would seem, right, to, to give glory to God, like memorizing scripture and spending hours in meditation have actually given no glory to God and glory to a part of God's creation. A, a, a monk could wash his hands and shave his head, but he can't change his heart. Only God can do that. And the heart of a life that gives glory to God is one that is completely dependent upon him and grateful to him. It can seem abstract. Schreiner, Tom Schreiner, gives a helpful quote on this particular verse. He says, the call to live for God's glory is not an abstraction, but manifests itself in the way that believers conduct their lives. If we look at all of life, we're able to see how we glorify God by the way that we depend upon him and are grateful to him. When we pay the bills, we recognize that everything that we have has been provided by God. When we change a child's dirty diaper, we're reminded that only God could clean up our mess. And it's much worse than whatever was in front of us. When we take a bite of, of, of cheesecake or something really good, right? We give thanks to God who is the giver of every good gift. When we tell old stories with friends that make us laugh and cry, 
We are grateful to the author of life who mingles joy and suffering to create a beautiful narrative that we could never imagine. When we use our creativity to solve problems at work, to to design a logo or to write code, we are dependent upon the creator that we were made in the image of. See, every single part of our life to give glory to God is, is a life of dependence and gratitude. So maybe you're wondering, okay, so how do I actually glorify God in my dependence? Well, what we're, what we're doing here this morning is, is really are gonna, we're going to zoom in on this particular verse and ask ourselves, how can we glorify God? So we're going to look at some other places. Um, if you want to write these down, you can, but these scriptures will be in my notes that go out in the weekly every week. So if you want to just look at them there, you can and listen now. But in 1 Peter 4.11, Peter says, Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now I want you to look at that passage. And, and what Peter says is that in everything, God would be glorified through Jesus Christ. How is God glorified in everything by us? Well, you can just look right before it. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Whenever you live your life by the strength that God supplies, God is gloried in all of it. Whenever you speak tenderly to a patient that is giving you a really hard time, and you're reliant upon God in that moment. You are giving glory to God. Whenever, whenever you choose in that moment to withhold gossip, even though it would make a conversation much more interesting, and you choose to rely upon the Holy Spirit in the strength that he supplies, you are glorifying God. In every single area of your life, where you rely upon the glory of God and rely upon the strength that he supplies, you are glorifying God. You see, we extend mercy because we've received mercy. We serve others because we have been served by Christ. Every single aspect of our life is dependent upon God. Not only that, we glorify God through our gratitude. Psalm 50, 23 says, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. What is the sacrifice that glorifies God in Psalm 50? Thanksgiving, right? Being thankful for the blessings of God. Are you as guilty as I am about praying for for something and then seeing that thing take place and then just totally forgetting about it? I feel like I do that all the time. There's something that's just making me extremely anxious, something I'm really worried about, something I'm like, oh Lord, please take care of this. And then everything goes smoothly and then I'm just like, all right. We're so guilty of that. What is the sacrifice that brings glory to God that we would would be constant in thankfulness? It's not just the action in itself. It's the heart behind the action. And when we are thankful, God is glorified. That's why Paul would say in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And for those of us who understand the gospel, the good news of Christ, dependence and thankfulness, dependence and gratitude should come naturally. What is the most obvious proof of your dependence? That if you were to stand before God relying on your own righteousness, we would have no ability to stand. And yet in that moment, Christ our advocate For those who have called upon him, Christ our advocate comes and says, my blood has washed away their sin and my righteousness has been placed on them. We are completely dependent upon Christ. What would make us more thankful than seeing that we've been given everything we need in Christ? 
This is what causes us to glorify God. And when we live a life that is for the glory of God, it is also for the good of others. Verse 31, God is glorified when we consider others. Look at what Paul says. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Paul has three categories in mind here, right? He's, he's considering the church, he's considering Jews, and he's considering Gentiles. These are three people, he says, that I have in mind while I'm acting in anything that I do. How are they going to perceive this, and how is this going to make much of God for them? Now, let me ask, when was the last time that you thought about your actions through the lens of another person's eyes? Oh, when was the last time that you thought about your actions through how, how is my, my friend who's still kind of curious about Christianity going to hear this bit of sarcasm that I use in this situation, right? I'm guilty of that all the time, right? How, how, is, how is this friend who's young in his faith going to look at my marriage and see the gospel either made much of in that or degraded by that? The way that I spend my time the way that I use my money, how are others going to see in those moments that God is ultimate? Paul would say here that every single action of his, he considered how the Jews, how the Greeks, how the church would be built up or let down by it. And his ultimate goal in it all was that many would be saved, that many would come to know Christ. We see this and then he, he goes on in chapter 11, verse 1. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. The third thing I want you to see is that God is glorified when we live a life that imitates Christ. The, the verse divisions were added uh, around, you know, the early 1200s, so they're not always quite accurate, right? I think this is perhaps one area that, that Stephen Langton, who, who wrote these chapters and verses in, uh, kind of could have went one more verse into chapter 10, because you have all of this stuff, right, where, where Paul is talking about how to live, and then he kind of gives this statement here, imitate me as I imitate Christ, and then it goes into some stuff about women wearing head coverings in church that I've got to talk about next week that's going to be Super interesting, so you're not going to miss it. I'll probably be like extremely nervous and just like stuck to my notes the whole time, so you'll want to be here for that. But, but what we see here is that, that Paul is, is telling the church, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, this assumes a couple things, right? That first, Paul knows Christ. He's imitating Christ, which means he knows Jesus, he is walking with Jesus. He is hearing the words of Jesus. He is meditating on the life of Jesus. He is in step with Jesus. He's united with Jesus. In order to imitate Christ, we've got to know Christ. And if we want to be able to tell others to imitate me as I imitate Christ, that means that, that we are living a life that is worth imitating not just in, in the things that we do in this room on Sunday morning, but in the way that we live. Discipleship is an all of life kind of thing to grow up into Christ. And, and so what we see Paul saying here is imitate me as I imitate Christ. And, and what my friend Ryan Brooks always says is that you won't pass on what you don't possess, right? You can't tell others to imitate me as I imitate Christ if you're not imitating Christ, and so as Paul says this, it's a call to be reminded of the gospel. It is a call to grow deeper in the gospel. And as believers grow deeper in the gospel, the gospel grows wider in the world. You see, there is a correlation here that as he grows deeper in the gospel, that more people would come to know and follow Jesus. Now here at the Oaks, we've said that we want to be about one thing throughout the, the course of 2019. Uh, if you've been around here for, for the past couple of months, you've heard a phrase over and over again. And that is that in 2019, we want every member to be a missionary. 
every person that calls the Oaks Church home. We want to see themselves as a missionary to the city of Cincinnati and the world. For you to be able to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Walk alongside me as I'm making much of Jesus, as I'm living my life for the glory of God and the good of others. Join me in that. Now, can you imagine what your life would actually be like if you could, if you could stand January 1, 2020 and look over the course of 2019 and, and say, I poured my life out for the glory of God and the good of others, how different your life would be. Can you imagine the peace that you would have if you were relying on the every second sovereignty of God in all of life? Can you imagine the joy that you would have in the midst of struggle and pain if you were consistently reminded of the promises of God? Can you imagine the way that the dynamic of your office would change if you were committed to praying for those people by name daily? Can you imagine the way that your neighborhood would be different if you just began to use your front yard as a meeting place once a month for people to gather together and eat some donuts, right? Like, what would it look like for you to leverage your life for the glory of God that you would live every moment asking, how can I glorify God? And how can I do good to others for his sake? I think that you would realize that your life is created for much more than perhaps you have been living for. We've said that we believe there are five responses to this, right? These are responses to the gospel. These are not things that we do that God would be satisfied with us, but things that we do because we are satisfied in God. And we've summarized those five responses with the words, come, bring, give, grow, and go. How are we gonna respond to the gospel? By consistently coming to Jesus by bringing, by giving, by growing, by going. When you came in this morning, you had a little four by six card in your chair and it has those five words on it. So one side kind of has the, the values and vision of the Oaks Church, but then the other side has these five verbs that we, we seek to grow in. And each of those, we kind of have some questions to help you realize your growth in those areas to say, am I growing? Am I becoming a missionary each and every day to the city of Cincinnati? I want to just run through those with you this morning. If we're going to glorify God in all of life, I think we begin with one word, come. This means that your relationship with Christ is personal, but not individual. Uh, do you hear what I'm saying when I say that? Your relationship with Christ is personal, right? It is a personal relationship, but it is not individual. It is not something to be lived alone, so you can ask yourself, how can I best prepare my heart for the gathering on Sundays and commit to celebrating the resurrection of Jesus every week? When Paul writes to the church here, saying whether you eat or drink, do everything in the glory of God, he's assuming they will be gathered together when this letter is read. That they're not just scattered about trying to figure out Christianity on their own, but they realize that the church is God's plan A for accomplishing his mission. And so they gather together. Now, how can we personally prepare our hearts each week to be imitating Christ and imitating others by consistently sitting under the authority of his word? Not only that, but by being in relationship with other believers. This is simply you asking, what would it look like for me to prioritize relationships within the Oaks beyond the Sunday gathering? You see, Paul's applying these biblical principles in the context of homes and in the public square. He's saying that believers live amongst one another because as they're imitating Christ, they're able to imitate one another. They're encouraged by one another. They're challenged by one another. They're building up one another. So what would it look like for you to say, I want to live under the authority of God's word and authentically with God's people? How would you change if you committed to those things? Bring, we want to bring others in because bridges are built when we bring people in. The first question here is, who doesn't look like me, right, but calls me a good friend? My heart is that this church would be a multi-generational church. This church would be a multi-ethnic church. So this church would stretch across economic divides because the gospel invites all in. The gospel is the good news for all people. My friend Moochie says all the time that we want our church uh, to look like 
Kroger at six and feel like our dinner table at seven, right? What does he mean by that? Because you go in Kroger at six o'clock, everybody's just gotten off work and everybody is in there. There's no type of person you cannot find in Kroger at six o'clock, right? It, it, is, it is like the nations are gathered at Kroger, right? And, and it's, 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 it's awesome to see the image of God in, in, in different ages, right? Somebody's dragging their kid through the aisle and, and then you have the elderly couple who shops together and that's like the cutest thing in the world, right? And, and you see all types of people. Well, we want our church to, to look like that but feel like your dinner table at seven. Or you can just say, you know what? The typical answer is, hey, how's today going? Good. But today hasn't been good. So that's not gonna be my typical answer, right? Where you truly bear one another's burdens, where, we, where you truly lean on one another. And the gospel makes us authentic people in that way. Two, this month, is there someone I can offer an invitation and a ride to on a Sunday morning? And have I? All right, what does it look like for me to, to bring people in and to show that the gospel builds bridges? and that the gospel makes people whole. One of the great examples I've seen of that in the life of our church is, uh, I know one of you had, had a breakfast, invited a ton of people from work over to your house uh, to have breakfast at 8.30, and then just said, hey, I'm going to church at 10. Anybody that wants to come with me, I would love for you to join. All right, what can you do to, to bring people into contact with Christ? Three, Give. We believe that generosity is more about what is in your heart than what is in your hands. So how can you use your time, treasures, and talents to make the gospel go forward in the city of Cincinnati? How are you uniquely gifted by God? And what has God uniquely gifted you that you can use for his glory? The second question, based upon my passions and the gifts that God has given me, where can I make the greatest contribution to our church family? This is saying that we just, we don't want to just put you where we need you. We want to put you where you need to be, right? So if you love serving with kids, if, if you love greeting people, if you love playing an instrument, then that's where we want you. But, but if you're saying, uh, that's not really the best place for me, but you know what, I'm, I'm really good at photography or videography. Well, then let's use that gift. Like how has God uniquely designed you for his glory? And how can you leverage that for his name? Fourth, grow. Healthy people grow and growing people change, right? We live in, in a place where I, I almost bet that if you were to walk down the sidewalk tomorrow and you just ask people, hey, are you, are you a Christian? Most people would say, yeah, absolutely, I'm a Christian. Yet Jesus says in Matthew 7 that, that many will say that, that they are his Lord and he'll look at them and say, I never knew you. Right? That's why the words of Matthew 7, 17 are so important. Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. What kind of fruit are you bearing? Do you wanna know if you're a Christian? Do you wanna know if you're walking with Christ? What kind of fruit are you bearing? This is why I would ask, what are you doing daily or regularly to cultivate your relationship with Christ? The Christian life is a lot like breathing, right? We inhale God's word, we inhale his promises, we inhale his command, and we exhale prayer and life. We're constantly breathing in the promises of God and exhaling the way that we live. So what are you doing daily or regularly to cultivate your relationship with Christ? Second, what sin is God making me more aware of in order to free me from with the power of the gospel? Is there something week in and week out that, you, that God is revealing to you in order to free you from with the power of the resurrection? Saying Christ died for this sin to set you free from it. Number five, the last one, go. Who is close to you but far from God? First question is, what is one thing that I could do this month to bring a friend closer to Christ? What is one thing I can do? What if you spent this entire year saying, I, I want this one person to know Christ who is currently far from him? 
How would you pray for that person differently? How would you invest your time in that person differently? What would you invite that person into because you are so concerned about them knowing Christ and having an eternity with God? What does closer look like, right? For some people, it may be, hey, let's start studying the Bible together. And other people may be totally freaked out by that. So you just need to say, hey, let's grab coffee this week. Right, what would it look like to bring a friend closer to Christ and who is one person that you would do that with? Second, what is one thing that I could do this year to see the gospel go to the nations? As we begin visiting some of our partner churches in, in London and in Miami and in the Middle East, maybe you'd say, you know what, I'm gonna begin setting aside money now so that I can be a part of one of those trips so that I can support one of those missionaries. Maybe it means you give a gift toward them. Maybe you just begin praying for them weekly. What can you do? Now, maybe you hear all these things, these verbs, right? And, and you're thinking, oh no, like I could, like, this just seems like so much to think about. There's no way that, that I could actually do this. Or maybe you think, oh, I've got this covered, right? I'm already doing these things. Like I'm always here and I'm always inviting people. I give each week. Whether you're in either of those categories, I wanna caution you. And I wanna remind you of John 15, verse four where Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Do you wanna bring glory to God? Do you want these to be marks of your life? Don't focus on these things, focus on Christ. As you abide in Christ, as you remain in him, as you remind yourself of the gospel, your life will bring glory to God. This is why the psalmist would write in chapter 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. When do we glorify God? When we realize that in the day of trouble, we cried out to him and he rescued us. If you're a Christian here this morning, and you're saying, you know what, there are areas that I don't glorify God and I want to, I would say, be reminded of the rescue you have received in Christ. That when you were a rebel and enemy of God, he sought you out. And that that rescue has produced a life that gives glory to him. Perhaps you're here this morning and you'd say, you know what, I, I thought I was a Christian or maybe I've been wrestling with the things of Christianity. I've been living for things that are lesser than the glory of God. And, and they have, offered me empty promises that have not brought joy, then I would invite you into a relationship with God this morning. I would say that there is great rescue to be found even in the midst of sin, shame, guilt. And that rescue is found in Christ because in the midst of your sin, he died on your behalf, taking on your sin and giving you his righteousness if you would only believe and trust in him. And this is the decision that produces a life that is glorifying to God. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful for the way that you speak through your word. Lord, it's difficult to take um, such a, a big concept as living our entire lives for however much time that you would give us for your glory to take that and, and talk about it for 40 minutes. Lord, I pray that that you would be glorified even in the preaching of your word. Lord, that if there's anything that's unhelpful or dishonoring to you, Lord, that, that would just fall to the wayside and where, uh, where you've just spoken to us through your spirit, Lord, that you would enable us to live a life that's glorifying to you. God, we, even this morning, we recognize our dependence. We recognize that we are dependent upon you in every second of our lives. And Lord, we are grateful that you've sustained us thus far and that your promises will meet us again when our feet hit the floor in the morning. Lord, I pray for the believer that is weary this morning or perhaps apathetic, that you would refresh them, that they have been rescued by you. Lord, I pray for, for those who are in Christ and perhaps have been so focused on their own walk with you that it has been to the neglect of others, that they would find great joy in making you known to our neighbors and, and those around the world. Lord, I pray for those that you're perhaps speaking to right now who, who feel the weight of their sin but, but just can't wait until this time is over that they can walk out the door and, and forget about this stuff. 
God, I pray that you would pursue them with your grace and they would not be able to shake the feeling that you are drawing them to yourself this morning. They would be set free from the captivity of sin and find life in Christ. God, teach us how to respond to you and your word. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen.